So we looked at the various uh, dimensions of the food crisis. We looked at uh, the need for distribution, uh, efficient distribution of food resources and avoidance of waste to uh, make sure that we have adequate food in the present. But in the future, we need more food. So we, we tried to uh, investigate whether industrial agriculture is the solution. And it turns out that uh, according to uh, what facts I have uh, brought to this discussion, it turns out that um, industrial agriculture may not be the, uh, the appropriate solution because it may, it may actually lead to an increase in uh, food insecurity. So uh, then we, we turn to uh, alternative forms of agriculture and uh, let us try to see if, if they can uh, help us in this matter. Now, in order to uh, understand why these alternative forms of agriculture actually are important or why they came about or why people developed them, uh, let us compare uh, anthroposystems or human made sy systems with ecosystems. Now, in anthroposystems, generally they are, uh, these are also similar to ecosystems, but they, they are generally more simple. They, they, have, uh, they, they can have about three trophic levels, uh, but they are open systems. So uh, again, recalling from the, uh, the lecture on sustainable development, we saw how you have resource, uh, resources extracted at one end and then the waste uh, dumped at the other end. So that is a characteristic of an open system. So in, in our usual agricultural systems, uh, they also operate in a linear fashion similarly. There is minimal recycling that happens. Uh, but the advantage is that uh, there is a high efficiency of transfer of biomass from one trophic level to the other trophic level. In other words, um, if, you, if you are looking at a rice field or a wheat field, uh, let us say 50% uh, of, uh, of the mass of the plant is the food grain, then nearly all of that food grain actually gets consumed. It goes to the next trophic level, which is, which is quite remarkable because in, if you compare it with um, ecosystems, you will find in, in, uh, in a forest, uh, there is a lot, lot of grass growing, but not all that grass get, gets even consumed by, the, by deer, so uh, by the herbivores. So that transfer from one level to the other that is very efficient in our uh, anthroposystems. But our anthroposystems are uh, very often they are monocultures uh, and uh, they are highly dense, um, uh, you know, um, growth of uh, of one or maximum two or three species. Uh, in an ecosystem, on the other hand, uh, there, there there are uh, there is high biodiversity and uh, a very high density of uh, one species alone uh, is not very common although there are there are instances of that too so what what we do is we have some crop plants which we call as crops and then anything else anything other than that is uh, branded as a weed and it is to be eliminated so this this is quite uh, quite different and quite contrary in philosophy to, um, to how ecosystems work because in ecosystems uh, there is nothing such as a weed, uh, there is nothing such as, uh, uh, there is nothing that is to be eliminated. Things keep uh, e each other in check, one species uh, uh, will, will keep another species in check but there is no, uh, no need for total elimination. So our uh, human uh, systems are static and they are quite unstable. So um, if there are any, any changes in, in the weather, if the rain uh, falls, I, either, either there is too much rainfall or there is uh, too little rainfall or it happens at the wrong time, uh, then your productivity takes a hit. Whereas uh, ecosystems are generally far uh, stabler, they are more resilient, they are quite robust, they are adapting and they are continuously evolving. So that, that thing is uh, not there. So if we, if we really want to um, have food security, then we have to pick up some elements from ecosystems to make our systems more stable and more productive. So I have similar numbers uh, as shared by uh, 
one of the remote centers from Shastra, I think it was Shastra, um, where we see that uh, we are depend on very few crop plants and although uh, we have many more edible varieties of uh, plants, but we do not depend on them and which is not a great idea. And uh, if we depend on very few species of plants, then we are uh, risking, uh, we, are, we are putting large populations at risk. And the best example of that is the um, Irish potato famine, where in a span of uh, three years, um, nearly one people died due to a combination of starvation and uh, disease. And why did that happen? It, it happened because the staple of Ireland uh, was potato and uh, the potato crop uh, caught a disease uh, which led to uh, a, a collapse in the productivity and which led to starvation and all that. So uh, at the same time in, in Peru, which was the cradle of the potato plant, they had a lot of diversity in the varieties of potato. In Ireland, there were only relatively few varieties of potato and uh, Ireland suffered major losses. But in Peru, there were relatively minor losses and this kind of a, a, a mass starvation never happened uh, during that same period. So we have several problems in our anthroposystems and we can only turn to nature and uh, natural ecosystems to learn how we can improve uh, our, uh, our anthroposystems. Now some, some things that are uh, very clearly uh, understood uh, are that we need to adopt low input sustainable organic farming methods. Why low input? Because there are organic agriculture methods which require high input such as you need to add lots of manure and maybe some biopesticide and labor costs are very high. So such systems even if they are organic are not going to be uh, suitable. So we need to develop systems that inherently do not require uh, very high inputs. There is another uh, important thing that we need to do is we need to go for uh, indigenous or uh, traditional crop varieties which are locally adapted. Uh, and the, the benefit is that if the plant is adapted to the local climate, soil, uh, moisture conditions uh, and including uh, the pests and diseases, then the, uh, the, the, your, your uh, agricultural system becomes more self-supporting. You do not have to prop it up with uh, various inputs uh, from outside. Uh, and then it uh, tends to be uh, more profitable. Um, there is a need to improve farm diversity and uh, if at all required, uh, some organic uh, bi or biological pest management methods uh, can be used. So we will we'll just uh, uh, take a, a brief overview of that. So based on these general principles, many people have developed uh, uh, different varieties of agriculture and they name it differently. So um, if a, s a person is more preoccupied with the notion of uh, sustainability, then he will call his farming as sustainable farming. If somebody is um, de develops a farming technique and he is very interested in uh, mimicking nature or something like that, then he call it ecological agriculture or things like that. Uh, so there are various uh, types of or various brands of uh, organic uh, or alternative agriculture. And all of them have, um, have some common uh, features, but then they differ in, in many other features also. So I have kind of made a summary uh, of the various features or characteristics of uh, these techniques, what all activities or processes that they have and how each of those activities or processes gives you some environmental benefit. I had a similar table for conventional agriculture where I showed how each of the agricultural processes have got some adverse environmental impact. We are developing alternatives only to, to remove those adverse environmental impacts. So uh, some of the characteristics of these uh, farming techniques uh, yeah, are, uh, are listed over here. So somebody is, let us say tomorrow I become uh, an alter, uh, organic farmer, I may choose no till or minimum tillage methods, ground mulching and interplanting. So my brand of organic farming may include like these two or three features, 
somebody else's uh, brand of farming may include some different uh, combination of these. This is what this table actually means. So, uh, among them no-till is, is something that is quite interesting and uh, maybe you can uh, look up on the internet about no-till methods of farming, tilling or tillage meaning ploughing. So, there are methods by which even without ploughing uh, you can uh, get good yields. Um, you would be surprised that uh, in the US uh, roughly 5 percent of agricultural land is under no-till cultivation. Now, you may say that, um, uh, that it is so good that uh, US agriculture is uh, doing good things, uh, but it turns out that they use copious amounts of um, herbicide. So, that is not really that good. Uh, there, are, there are methods of no-till agriculture even without uh, herbicides and I am going to show you uh, uh, one such method. Ground mulch is one very important uh, thing that can benefit Indian agriculture in my opinion. M mulching is covering the soil with either living or dead organic matter. So, either you have a green mulch which is living plants covering the soil or you have a brown mulch which is dead organic matter leaf uh, litter or uh, agricultural residue from the previous crop that can be put on, uh, uh, on the uh, soil. So, if the soil is covered, uh, then uh, it, uh, it does not get heated, overheated due to sunlight, the, the UV light does not kill off uh, the beneficial soil uh, biota and uh, the uh, drying out as well as the uh, oxidation of humus is hindered. Moreover, the mulch also provides micro habitats for predators of uh, agricultural pests. Now, there are fears of uh, some diseases also um, uh, finding that uh, mulch uh, as, a, as a fertile breeding ground, but uh, if there are adequate uh, quantities of natural predators, then it has been observed in, in many um, uh, of these uh, organic uh, farms that uh, the pest problem does not uh, become such a severe problem. Moreover, if you mulch the ground um, adequately, then uh, incidence of weeds uh, also reduces because uh, the weeds, uh, if, the, if the soil is covered by a thick mulch, uh, the weed, uh, weed uh, uh, plants cannot uh, sprout up. Um, so, that, that is one important benefit. Interplanting, I think the benefits of interplanting are quite well known uh, in uh, interplanting uh, or intercropping uh, in improves crop diversity. And uh, in, in that, uh, in the species that they normally plan, it is common to have some leguminous plants to fix nitrogen and that uh, benefits the system. Uh, one more feature which is often not uh, given adequate attention is the role of beneficial organisms such as earthworms and bees. Uh, there are many others, there are wasps also. So, these are creatures that actually are our friends and they, they provide various services such as in the case of bees, they pollinate plants, even birds do that. Um, earthworms, you know, are very important for the soil. The wasps, for instance, uh, are, uh, uh, they, they feed on the pests of plants. So, if we provide shelters where wasps can have their nests, then uh, you, are, you are building up um, uh, resistance towards pests in your agricultural system. Uh, there are there are many more points and uh, again as i said each of them is uh, is like a hyperlink there is much to learn and much to know about each of them uh, so uh, i think teachers should uh, those who are interested should take the time to um, do that farm diversity is very important uh, the indigenous uh, crops with diversity um, is is one of the most important features everything starts with the seed and uh, it is important as uh, Dr. Vandana Shiva uh, explained to us that uh, the seed uh, is the birthright of the farmer and it must always remain in the hands of the farmer and um, it is the farmers have to develop and uh, maintain their own seeds so that we get uh, good uh, produce. So, there are, there are many slides with a lot of detail and uh, I leave that uh, to you. I am going to take a few questions that uh, 
uh, that um, many people ask about uh, organic uh, or alternative farming methods. Um, the first one uh, is that whether it can feed everybody. So I have taken them one by one and I am kind of going to go fast on that. The explanations are provided over there, but I will briefly just touch upon them because unless those qu queries are satisfied, we do not um, we do not feel uh, that it actually is a good solution. So, um, in the context of future food security, I do not think either conventional or organic or any agriculture is by itself going to be enough. And the reason I am saying that is if the population continues to rise unabated, if land degradation happens to increase as at the rate at which it is increasing, if climate change also happens, and if uh, the water crisis um, again grows to the, the proportions that we expect it to grow, and I do not think any farming method is going to be adequate. But uh, there, are, uh, there are modeling studies that show that organic agriculture, if implemented on a large scale, will not reduce the, the productivity. In fact, it may increase it uh, in the long run because it will actually slow down each of these problems which I just mentioned, except for population, it will slow down the others. For instance, it may it will slow down land degradation, it, it, it may even enrich the soil. Uh, it, organic systems, if designed properly, not all organic systems, but properly designed organic systems can be uh, designed for low irrigation inputs, still yielding uh, high amount of calories. So, in that sense, uh, there, there is there is lot of promise in, uh, in organic methods as opposed to the conventional methods where you are assured of land degradation and over exploitation of water resources as well as pollution of the environment and the health effects. So, um, in order to actually ensure food security, we have to work on all these aspects together. Uh, that this is what I started uh, uh, my, my first session with the sustainable development where I said that in order to solve one problem, you must also be working at all the other problems also. You cannot uh, expect that only by uh, making some slight modifications in your agricultural systems that you can ensure future food security. You have to deal with the water problem also and many other things. So, if all these things are, are done together, then organic farming will actually be uh, uh, more than satisfactory and it will be, uh, it will pave the way towards future food security. Now, the second question is um, whether they give you high enough yields. Now, it turns out they do give uh, high enough yields. I have, I have some references over here, there are many more and I have spoken to and visited many farms of good organic farmers. As I said, you have to get it right. That applies to anything, uh, even um, I mean it is like saying uh, if you if you drive a car, can you can you go fast? Yes, obviously you can go fast, but you have to learn to drive a car. If if you don't know how to drive a car, uh, you, your car may not even start moving. So uh, there is a there is a, an element of learning. There is uh, there is some time that may be required. But once you get it, it is definitely going to yield high. Uh, there are so this uh, large survey found that in the case of irrigated lands, uh, transitioning from conventional agriculture to organic agriculture gave only a marginal benefit, only slight improvement in benefit because the irrigated uh, lands were already operating at high productivity. But in, in the case of rain fed crops, because of water stress and uh, low soil fertility, the, the yields which were very low upon conversion to organic farming, uh, the, the yields increased quite drastically from 50 to 100 percent increase. And that mainly comes from uh, addition of um, or, uh, organic uh, carbon in the soil, better availability of nutrients, the soil being able to hold more moisture and the, uh, the uh, diversity that in many projects were, was included. So, you had some leguminous plants also in that. So, all these factors all, uh, contributed to increasing um, the productivity of rain fed crops. Now, this is very significant because 65 percent of India's arable land is rain fed. So, we need to find a solution for increasing the productivity of those rain fed crops without placing an additional demand on the uh, uh, water, uh, on water for irrigation. 
and those uh, crops which are those lands 35% which are irrigated they can make do with much less water so that water is freed up for other other uses now there is a transitional phase uh, if you are uh, if you have over exploited the land and added lots of uh, chemical fertilizers and the soil quality is very low then maybe it will take 1 to 4 years for the for the soil and the entire soil ecosystem to uh, to kind of uh, uh, rejuvenate during which period there may be slightly reduced yields about 30% uh, you may take a hit in the yields in the transitional phase but after that they will they will stabilize again to a, a high productivity level now uh, if if those products are uh, organic then in in places uh, if they are certified and if there are uh, proper um, uh, outlets for that they, you can command a premium price now that is not always always true because uh, access to such uh, stores and such markets uh, has to be there and some some of them require certification which is an extremely tedious process uh, and in fact it is in my opinion it is uh, uh, unfair because uh, the people who are polluting they they they, they don't have to go through this uh, uh, this extra exercise but the people who are doing the right thing they have to go through this enormous uh, pain now there is another factor which uh, which i had mentioned in the context of food forests of over yields that take place in polycultures a polyculture is, uh, is is a is a system in which you have multiple species that are planted together and the the combined output of these multiple species exceeds a monoculture in in many cases so that is called as an over yield now in um, the traditional uh, in mexico they have uh, what are called as the three sisters so they don't plant corn corn is their staple but they don't plant corn alone um, corn is uh, it is almost like sacred to them they plant the three sisters together and the three sisters are uh, uh, they plant corn they have these mounds of uh, compost and uh, some mulch and in that they plant these three sisters one is corn the second is a variety of beans and the third is a variety of squash so the three together uh, give some synergistic effects and uh, the uh, the over yields as compared to a monoculture are uh, about 50% uh, so the, uh, the the reason they give the over yields is um, the the corn plant requires some nitrogen which is fixed by the beans and the bean requires some support so it climbs onto the corn the squash um, prefers the shade and it it spreads on the ground since it is covering the ground the the ground retains better moisture it is a green mulch kind of so um, uh, the, the the soil remains more fertile and uh, the overall productivity is higher now some uh, studies have even found over yields as high as 150% another study has found a consistent 15 uh, 5 to 15% increase in yields due to intercropping now there is um, a, a, a move towards perennial polycultures so if you instead of having to do all those agricultural operations starting from plowing the soil uh, then uh, seeding and then uh, weeding then adding fertilizer and pesticides and all, so many intensive activities that are conducted in agriculture um, if we have a perennial system which you don't have to replant it will seed itself or or those plants are long lived and you simply go there and you harvest and you take what you need and the system is kind of self standing so you don't have to do all those things so there is a, the land institute in, in the united states where they are uh, working out various combinations of uh, of plants uh, which will uh, remain there perennially uh, i showed you um, about uh, one uh, food forest uh, that that existed for 300 odd years i now want to show you a video of how starting from scratch you can start a food forest so this is a food forest that is uh, that will give uh, mainly it will give fruits but it doesn't have to be that way you can change the species and you can have it give even uh, vegetables and things like that so this is a, a seven minute video which is uh, going to show us the various stages in actually making a food forest uh, remember that the food forest is a is a perennial system you don't have to do all those regular operations 
in the initial setup phase you may have to do a few operations which are again very easy operations uh, as something as simple as just chopping the plants a little. The reason they chop, they, they, you, will, you will hear a phrase uh, over there uh, called chop and drop and the, the, the principle is that a, a plant uh, the, uh, has the roots which are sucking in uh, moisture and the leaves which are transpiring. So there is a, a kind of a steady state that is set up. If you chop the plant, uh, then uh, the roots are going to continue to uh, suck in moisture. So the sap will ooze out. So in order to prevent that, uh, when, the, when the shoots are chopped, the plant uh, sheds some of the root biomass under the soil. It gives up some of the root biomass. It reduces the biomass. So that biomass is added to the, uh, to the soil, which starts to decompose and that decomposition process uh, is enabled by uh, uh, or soil organisms, uh, uh, large numbers of, of uh, fungi and uh, bacteria actually uh, proliferate over there uh, which enriches the soil. So when you repeatedly do that, uh, the soil gets enriched and uh, a kind of a regenerative process sets up. So ex exploiting this process and then some other things, uh, they are going to uh, actually engineer uh, a um, an, e an artificial ecological succession. People who know about uh, ecology uh, a little bit, uh, uh, there are some pioneer species that uh, on a barren or an abandoned land will first uh, 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 first uh, strike root over there and grow. They will produce some biomass and uh, improve the soil and these with, with, with improved conditions then different species of plants will then find it uh, easy to grow over there. So uh, the, the species mix goes on changing uh, as, the, uh, as the region finally matures into a forest. So this ecological succession that happens naturally, they have tried to engineer it to make a food forest. So in a short period of about 5 years, you can have a, a nice tall standing food forest. Let us see how. Uh, it is pretty much self standing after it is established, it does not require any inputs from us. As, as I said, your input may only be required to increase or to manipulate the, the production of the various species. He, he said that there are some so, what I am talking about, such a system is resilient to, to climate change because you have woody trees. Uh, which are which are much more uh, resistant to uh, small spells of drought uh, even if even if the monsoon fails uh, we have in india we have a monsoon climate so it's uh, sometimes the monsoon doesn't um, provide enough rain and if the monsoon fails then your uh, your regular monoculture crops will suffer very serious uh, uh, problems but such a forest is more resilient and uh, the, the species uh, can be, uh, can be uh, determined or can be selected based on the local conditions. So what, what grows over there locally is, uh, is absolutely the starting point for uh, choice of species. Uh, exotics are generally not a good idea. Uh, but there are uh, in, in uh, India, I have seen that uh, people who have tried to make these food forests, they use some exotic species particularly as the pioneer species and then they gradually eliminate them. So uh, th that is also another approach to take. So uh, what is the, uh, what is the secret behind uh, profitability of organic systems? See, uh, there are, see you have the A profit is the uh, is the difference between the two. So there are two ways. Either you can increase your uh, your output or you can reduce your inputs. Either way, you get profits. So uh, in organic systems, the uh, the output actually is high, or as we saw in according to some studies, is it is it improves. It is even higher higher than the regular uh, or the conventional methods using monocultures. So uh, the the outputs are high and the inputs are quite low. So if you design systems specifically to be low input systems, then your inputs will be very low. So as a result, your, your profit is, uh, is quite high 
and then um, the, uh, the additional advantage is that the, uh, the inputs that are required are not external inputs. Meaning, uh, you may be adding some manures, but uh, they, they may come from the livestock that is already there on your farm, uh, not uh, some chemical uh, fertilizers purchased uh, from some multinational company. Uh, if, if you have uh, adequate mulch in your farm, then even the weeding, uh, labor cost uh, related to weeding and all can come down significantly. So, this is how uh, you, you can actually ensure uh, that these organic uh, systems are economically feasible. Uh, in uh, there is a study which talks about uh, the uh, economic uh, uh, viability of organic cotton and they found that over a period of 6 years um, in the case of cotton uh, there was a reduction in cost of cultivation and there was an increased uh, gross as uh, there were increased gross and net returns. So, it, it actually works out. Um, in, in many cases. Now, organic uh, products uh, retain better quality, they uh, even post storage, uh, they have, um, they retain their quality and um, um, the spoilage uh, during storage also is less. There are some people who have argued whether since you are putting manures uh, which come from animal dung or uh, something like that might be. Uh, might uh, lead to some diseases or things like that, whether they are safe or not. But uh, many studies have uh, found that there is uh, there are no health risks uh, to exposure from microbiological contaminants. Of course, the composts have to be made properly. You cannot mismanage things and expect favorable results. So there are procedures. There are uh, there is a good way of doing it, and there are bad ways of doing it. Uh, but if if done properly, then uh, that this is not a major concern. Um, in fact, they are quite superior and health, uh, healthful in uh, on a number of parameters, uh, the amounts of vitamins and minerals and things like that. Uh, they have fewer mycotoxins which, which can be a major problem. Pest management is again uh, one area where you do not wait for the problem to happen. You start by feeding the soil, you make sure that the soil is fertile. How do you make sure the soil is fertile? I showed you that video on, on uh, soil conservation practices. Moreover, we have to cover the soil with mulch, make sure there is adequate organic matter, uh, the soil should have balanced nutrients. The plants that grow, the crop plants that grow in, uh, in healthy soil, if they come from good uh, locally adapted uh, indigenous seeds, then they will be quite resilient to, uh, to both climatic variations as well as uh, pest attack. So, such healthy plants uh, will, will require very little inputs from our side for pest management. Then whatever little inputs are required can be uh, managed by uh, the beneficial organisms that I told you, uh, uh, na encouraging natural predators. There is a variety of uh, natural predators uh, that, that are found in a, in a farm environment. Some of them are spiders, uh, wasps, frogs, lizards, birds even. So, they, are, they all feed on different organisms, different uh, uh, insects which are pests, uh, which we consider as pests, they consider that as food. So, uh, the enemy of an enemy is a friend. So, uh, encouraging these organisms, now these uh, spiders and wasps, they do not feed on your crop. There is no need to eliminate them. In fact, they are beneficial. So, we should encourage them. Spiders uh, uh, do uh, an important job, I mean, even, in, uh, even if the spider does not have to consume that insect right away, many insects get caught in their, in their webs. So, uh, they, are, they are eliminated from your farm. So, uh, giving them good habitat uh, itself is a, is a big contribution to the pest management. And then in the uh, eventuality that there is some uh, uncontrolled pest attack, there are, there are um, alternative um, organic uh, uh, pesticides such as neem and there are many others, many other concoctions that can be made um, because this kind of uh, intervention should be done at, at the very last stage. The, uh, the main intervention begins from the soil and choosing the right, uh, right crops, main, uh, protecting the, the natural predators of the pests. If these main things are taken care of then uh, with, with uh, minor inputs of uh, some organic uh, pesticides, the job can be done very easily. And at least this is, this is how many people have, many organic farmers have managed it. 
just because uh, you and me who have very little experience if we try to make some experiment and it fails it doesn't mean that uh, it, it it is uh, it is a failure because there is a learning process and uh, i'm i'm repeatedly saying that because uh, during my college days i did a number of such farming experiments um, on my uh, uh, father's farm uh, although very small farm but i did very good experiments on that i i learned a lot but uh, i i uh, i actually uh, don't mind uh, sharing this that most of my experiments failed but it is through the failures that i learned and uh, success comes uh, only after after many failures but uh, when it comes you know it really gives you a lot of satisfaction and i'll just tell you what what those some of those experiments were uh, in a bit organic farming is more environmentally friendly as uh, uh, this review uh, of over 300 published reports says on various parameters organic farming was found to be more environmentally friendly than uh, conventional farming you know this is important to understand because um, it is not um, even organic methods can uh, end up damaging the environment uh, there are environmental impacts even of organic agriculture methods but it turns out that they are smaller than the conventional methods uh, organic input Uh, is very important organic input to the soil there is a lot of surplus biomass and I, i i told in the energy chapter that that surplus biomass if there is uh, anything that requires that surplus biomass then it is uh, the soils that require it because the soils are uh, the, the place from where we get our food so the first priority should be given to feeding the soil and if uh, if you add uh, uh, the surplus biomass to the soil as mulch Uh, you can or in the or after composting as compost for every ton of carbon added per hectare uh, to a degraded soil it can increase crop yields uh, by 20 to 40 kg per hectare for wheat and 10 to 20 kg per hectare for maize so uh, it can uh, it achieves multiple ends uh, you require less uh, external fertilizer uh, you can en- enrich the soil Uh, you can also sequester carbon so the soil holds more carbon otherwise that carbon would have oxidized and gone into the atmosphere uh, no tilling uh, no till methods are uh, are probably the best for um, protecting the soil because every time you run a plow through the soil you damage the roots you compact the soil and all these uh, destructive processes kind of start uh, this is a 12 minute video that i'm going to show you uh, but i want to save it for the last so i want to save the dessert for the last so although it is relevant over here um, this is about a veteran uh, gandhian uh, organic farmer mr uh, bhaskar save who has won several awards uh, he recently passed away but uh, not without contributing immensely to the field of uh, organic agriculture and he is a very very well respected figure uh, in this area and i was uh, very fortunate to have met him in person i stayed in his house uh, i visited his farm along with a friend of mine uh, so I, i watching that video actually uh, gave me very good memories of my college days uh, so we'll watch that uh, towards the end um, also in this context people who are interested in uh, in organic agriculture um, maybe organic gardening i mean you don't have to do it as a profession um i strongly very very strongly recommend reading this book the one straw revolution by masanobu fukuoka uh, he is a japanese uh, person again he uh, passed away a few years ago but he is probably can best be described as the grandfather of um, natural farming his method is uh, his agricultural method is so unique uh, he um he does not till the soil he does not uh, i mean even he he makes seed balls uh, so he takes a mixture of clay uh, compost and the seeds uh, and uh, he just uh, makes it into a dough and make the makes these uh, maybe a centimeter or size balls and dries them in the shade and uh, even in that uh, the seeds that he add he adds a mixture of seeds and then he simply tosses it onto the field covers it with the straw of the of the last uh, season and uh, allows the rains to come and then the crop sprouts it it grows above the mulch the brown mulch 
and he also grows among the seeds is also a nitrogen fixing cover crop called as white clover which is very similar to alpha alpha if uh, if some of you know know about it so the cover crop kind of uh, covers the ground and the rice grows up and uh, then he, uh, he when the rice is about to be harvested uh, maybe a uh, 15 days two weeks before that he similarly sprinkles uh, balls of uh, containing wheat or barley seed uh, for the winter season and then he harvests the, the, the rice, uh, threshes the rice, puts the straw back on the field, the wheat sprouts through the, through the mulch and uh, so basically he has the wheat and rice in succession and uh, the productivities that he has got are just phenomenal. Uh, I mean they can compare with, uh, with the best uh, farms uh, in the world and um, th he absolutely does not uh, add any, fertil any fertilizers or chemicals, uh, there is no weeding. His, uh, his uh, fields have uh, the cover crop uh, in, in plenty and there are many weeds in his field, uh, but uh, they, are, they are adequately suppressed by the cover crop, uh, so they do not really compete in a big way with the, with the rice crop, rice or the winter uh, grain crop. So uh, it's an awesome book, and he he talks uh, about many things uh, apart from the actual practices, uh, the agricultural practices that he follows. He talks about many things related to food, agriculture, and uh, you know long-term uh, food security also. So it's a must-read. Uh, this book is out of print. It has been out of print for uh, decades. Uh, even when I got it, um, I think 20 years ago. Um, it was with great difficulty, but now uh, people have made PDFs of this and this is, uh, you just click this link and you will find it, uh, a P PDF for download. Um, there are many, uh, many videos related to his farm. This 24 minute one is quite a good video, you can watch that. There is a longer one hour video also available. Uh, you can search for it on your own and uh, watch that, but definitely it is worth learning for people who are interested. Other important thing which I, I touched upon and this is a kind of a sensitive area for many, many people and they uh, do not want to address this problem, they just want to uh, brush it aside or uh, you know pretend as if they did not uh, hear, but uh, I am uh, taking some risk over here and still going to talk about it. Uh, it is about uh, vegetarianism and uh, its uh, relevance to uh, the, uh, the environmental problem, the food problem. Uh, it turns out that uh, yeah, even uh, the IPCC chairman also made uh, a statement in Geneva that uh, it is vegetarianism is one of the best ways to fight uh, global warming and there is a reason for that. Uh, you, you see that uh, world meat production has increased over the past uh, half century, it has increased nearly uh, fivefold. And uh, as I explained to you based on the trophic pyramids, if you instead of being a primary consumer, if you are a secondary consumer that is a meat eater, uh, then uh, you require much greater land to support you, much uh, greater quantity of the autotrophs which are the plants and plants require land area. So. Um, you require much more uh, to feed you. Now this data is uh, a little out of date when the world population was 6 billion, but at that point uh, the 6 billion uh, humans uh, shared the uh, earth with 1 billion pigs, 3 billion cows, 1.8 billion sheep and goats and 13.5 billion chickens. So that is 3 heads of livestock per person. Uh, even now I think the numbers are, uh, are not going to be any less if at all they might have increased. So. Uh, uh, this again shows how, how meat consumption has, has increased, um, so has human, human population, but again some, some of the livestock uh, uh, types like chickens have increased very drastically. If you compare with other countries, India is way down. As expected, the United States is somewhere at the top in meat consumption and India is somewhere at the bottom. So in that sense, that is thanks to a lot of large uh, proportion of Indians who are vegetarian, even 
even the people uh, in india who consume meat uh, they they do consume significant uh, amounts of vegetarian food and then they have a few uh, non vegetarian dishes uh, which is quite different from uh, the diets in other parts uh, this talks about uh, the the protein intake and you know what is where we source our uh, protein intake uh, in, in india we uh, uh, a large fraction of our protein intake comes from uh, plant based uh, sources uh, meat eating is actually uh, implicated in a number of health problems and uh, even the chinese government has uh, uh, has noticed this problem and uh, th there is a, a a call for moving away from particularly from red meats uh, so the there is nearly uh, literally an explosion in the cardiovascular disease and cancers uh, in the proportion of uh, cardiovascular disease and cancers uh, there are uh, researchers uh, all over the world other than indians also um, who claim that the the low quality plant protein which uh, actually allows uh, steady synthesis of new proteins is actually healthier as compared to the high quality animal protein we all understand that animal protein is considered to be high quality protein compared to plant uh, protein uh, but it's actually the lower quality which is uh, which is better because it is consistent with uh, with uh, less diseases and um, uh, longevity also and uh, so um, you know there are there are these vegetarian based diets which can keep your cholesterol level uh, very low Uh, and uh, where the risk of cardiovascular disease is very very small and quite insignificant at least until old age um, at the turn of the century heart disease and uh, cancer were uh, very small contributors to death but now they have uh, increased quite drastically uh, which is something to uh, um, be concerned about okay so uh, according to uh, this uh, scientific american uh, article the best diet for um, humans for infants it is mother's milk and for adults it is fruits vegetables whole grains pulses and nuts so this kind of a diet is uh, is the best uh, for for humans according to this article and um, uh, the um, I, i know many indians who are uh, claimed vegetarians they are actually the majority of them are lacto vegetarian so in other words we consume milk milk is not strictly vegetarian but it does not involve killing an animal so we we, we kind of associate it with uh, it with uh, vegetarianism but consuming the quantities of um, ghee uh, and uh, fried items you know the vegetable oils that we consume Uh, you cannot claim that to be a healthy diet so uh, although indian vegetarian diet kind of generally fits in this uh, diet but sometimes the amounts of uh, fried foods and uh, the uh, uh, ghee that uh, some people use is just uh, too much i mean uh, i don't think that can any come anywhere close to a healthy diet okay um so there are even people are uh, even uh, thinking that uh, there are some studies which say that the uh, the meat industry is actually a drain on the uh, american economy because they consume so much of meat uh, it just turns out that the the sales of uh, meat uh, in us are almost equivalent to the um, to the healthcare costs uh, in the us so the, uh, the, the there appears to be a relation between the two that you you eat more and more meat and you spend um, uh, money in uh, in the hospital for um, treatment of cancer and cardiovascular diseases it's quite likely that there is a uh, that it's a net drain on the american economy and uh, why america because they consume more meat so the effects are obvious in in that so when when so many people are are starving is it uh, yesterday uh, in the last session there there were uh, uh, some discussions about uh, ethical issues being uh, part of the sustainability discussion uh, the sustainability discourse and uh, th these ethical issues come in the in the choice of food that we have in the uh, in the consumption of various resources in the consumption of energy 
in the choice of energy uh, energy sources that we choose ethical issues are uh, come up everywhere and uh, particularly when we are faced with so many starvation deaths to divert some of the um, uh, way, uh, food that is available to um, to cattle feed uh, is uh, definitely is a, an ethical problem and we need to address that now what is the problem you may say that okay i am diverting some grain or uh, to feed uh, uh, the animal and then we are getting the meat from the animal uh, so that that doesn't work uh, work out as easily as that because for getting 1 kg of meat you have to spend 7 kgs of grain but those 7 kgs of grain could have directly fed many more people with 1 kg of meat you can feed fewer people but with 7 kilograms of grain if cooked uh, you can feed many more people so if if the food grain that is diverted towards livestock is actually taken up by humans it can uh, it can either completely feed everybody or at least uh, to a large extent so these are some kind of interesting numbers if an american reduced his meat consumption only by 5% then it he would end up uh, feeding all the hungry people in the US and if he reduces it by maybe 50 percent then maybe he can feed uh, all the poor people in uh, maybe few other countries also. Uh, so this talks about uh, 6 kgs of plant protein is uh, being required to create 1 kilogram of high quality animal protein whereas that 6 kgs of plant protein if directly given to, to humans then it will uh, actually satisfy the requirement. Now, uh, meat eaters are, uh, contribute to greater energy use as compared to uh, vegetarians because meat consumption requires 20 times as much energy to produce one calorie uh, of animal food. So, this tabulates uh, the uh, energy consumption uh, of, uh, so how much energy is put in and how much energy uh, do you get. So, you have to put in four units of energy. Uh, to get one unit of energy through uh, meat, chicken. Okay, uh, in the case of beef, you have to put in 54 units to get uh, one unit of uh, energy. And in the case of grains, uh, this is a, a little uh, uh, surprising, and uh, there is a reason too for that. Uh, for grains, it appears as if you have to put three units to get one unit. That is not entirely correct because uh, that may be so for uh, industrial agriculture where there are lots of uh, uh, fossil fuels that are used uh, to give in energy. But the traditional uh, food production systems and particularly the, the uh, polyculture and the no-till natural farming methods of Fukuoka, uh, they, are, uh, they require an insignificant amount of energy to be put in and uh, you actually get energy and farming or any growing plant should not require energy inputs to give you energy output because it is the, the it is taking energy from the sun the energy that we put in uh, is is really not even required uh, for for natural ecosystems they take all their energy from the sun which is not uh, factored in in this calculation so really speaking uh, no energy from human beings should be required but nevertheless we, we do have our agricultural systems which require some human labor or some things. So some small quantities of uh, energy alone will be required. Um, the um, factory farms of livestock they actually contribute to a lot of uh, methane emissions. They consume huge quantities of water to produce one pound of beef uh, some five tons of um, uh, of water is used and uh, for lettuce and tomatoes and all these vegetables very very small quantities of water is used uh, to create one pound of food. Um, so water consumption again uh, is energy consumption uh, is, is high for meat, uh, water consumption is also very high for meat. If you pass up one hamburger uh, then you would have saved uh, water enough for taking 40 showers with a low flow uh, shower head. So even, even if you are consuming meat then uh, shifting from pork to chicken will require half the grain and half as much of water. Uh, but in reality uh, life, uh, these livestock farms are so big and they are even increasing uh, that uh, 
uh, the, the waste uh, from these farms it has become a problem. In fact, there is this um, pig farm somewhere in Utah which produces more sewage than the city of Los Angeles and Los Angeles is among the largest cities in the world. So this one pig farm uh, over 50,000 acres produces more sewage than the city of Los Angeles and livestock in the US produces 130 times as much waste as humans. Land requirements, again, uh, you require much more land uh, if you are uh, dependent on beef and uh, other forms of meat, but you require less uh, land if you uh, are vegetarian. So the graph over here shows uh, that um, the, the calorific needs of uh, how many people can be satisfied on 2.5 acres of land. So if you have beef, then you would uh, satisfy only one person, uh, but if you are eating, getting all your calorie inputs through cabbage, then maybe 23 people can be supported on 2.5 acres. A similar calculation is made by uh, uh, Fukuoka in 1985, so when the world population was 5 billion, so he said that if everybody is uh, consuming uh, grains alone as their main diet, then uh, you could support 60 times the world population at that time, meaning 60 times 5 billion, so many humans could be supported on the earth's uh, land area. And if everybody ate potatoes, then it would be 20 times. If everybody ate beef, then it would be only uh, 5 billion that can be supported. Okay. Topsoil loss, again, overgrazing leads to topsoil loss. Uh, this is a major problem. Uh, again, the, the most uncomfortable uh, a topic in this uh, context of uh, vegetarianism is uh, animal slaughter. Some, even in the United States alone, some 9 billion animals are killed for food each year. And all this is when plenty of vegetarian food is available for Americans. So the same applies to uh, urban Indians. There is no shortage of vegetarian food in the urban places. Um, so when, when that is the case, it is clearly a choice, a, a preference. It is not a matter of need. There is no need uh, for, for consuming non-vegetarian food. It is only a, it's a matter of your tongue. And for, that, for the sake of that, if so many animals are killed, uh, how can we run away from the ethical aspect of this uh, issue? So uh, many people have on, on spiritual or uh, similar philosophical grounds have um, favored vegetarianism, including uh, Gandhi and, and many other uh, followers of uh, Gandhi. There, are, um, there is the Jain community uh, in India which is uh, very uh, vehement about vegetarianism and uh, so, so, so definitely some of their arguments are, are worth taking into consideration. Uh, reducing meat is actually a win-win situation because you will, if you reduce meat, uh, not only will your health improve, the environment will also benefit and uh, it is also more ethical. So uh, in, in all contexts, actually reducing meat is good. Uh, it is uh, very much possible use, uh, with a vegetarian diet to live a very happy, healthy life uh, free of disease. Uh, meat is absolutely not uh, uh, compulsory. So uh, and, and again, some animal protein that is required can be taken uh, through uh, by way of uh, milk products. So a lacto-vegetarian uh, diet seems to be uh, a, a good balance. I am not saying that there are no ethical issues with dairy farming. There are ethical issues. Uh, nobody is exempt from those issues. Uh, there are unethical practices that happen even in dairy farming. But uh, it does not mean that since uh, some unethical issues are unavoidable, therefore you, you do a massacre of 9 million uh, animals. It's, uh, that is not justified. Uh, the unethical issues that happen in the dairy industry should also be, be uh, eliminated. The, that is my stand on it. Okay, so um, what can you personally do to alleviate this problem? I have a, a long list of things. Support local produce, grow your own food, urban gardens, uh, rooftop gardens. Uh, if you have some land somewhere in your native place, you can try to uh, move to uh, organic farming support local farmers and consumers. Sometimes when they have excess production, 
you can take it up uh, if that that time you need not i i know everybody is entitled to their choice of what they want to purchase for food but if there are local farmers and if they have surplus production we can accommodate them if we accommodate them then spoilage of food is reduced and uh, it it helps the environment helps the farmer uh, mnc marketed uh, gm crops uh, can be a problem and uh, they should be avoided if whenever possible um, home cooked food is best preserved food has got lots of embodied energy and it's not even as healthy and so that can also be avoided um those who are vegetarian uh, great those who are not vegetarian can consider um sparing some of the grain and some of the arable land for feeding poor people and reducing their meat consumption uh, lokmanya tilak in this uh, context uh, made a very uh, interesting statement uh he was writing a letter to his nephew who was going to the west uh, to uk for uh, higher studies so he gave his um, very uh, fatherly oncular advice to his uh, nephew and um, he basically all all the good things you know that uh, hold on to your values all that glitters is not gold you have to work hard and things like that all good things and in that uh, he he even made a statement uh, which can roughly be translated like this it, the letter was in marathi uh but uh, it can be roughly translated like this don't turn your stomach into a graveyard for unfortunate dead animals this was one of the uh, advices that uh, tilak gave his um uh, nephew so um so we have so many things that we can actually do for this and um we have come to the uh, end of this session uh, i i want to end with this uh, beautiful video of uh, shri bhaskar save uh, who is a uh, was a gandhian uh, organic agriculturist in uh, south gujarat the maharashtra border very close to a place called dahanu uh, the actual uh, village is umbargao so uh, let us watch this video uh, it's a very nice video there are some uh, there are some interviews with him in which he speaks in hindi but there are english subtitles so if there are people who are sitting at the back of a uh, uh, seminar hall I, i request you to please come up front uh, so that you can read the subtitles in case you do not understand hindi so the the, the video is uh, actually a documentary in english but there are some interviews that are in hindi i visited his farm when i was in college uh, i really enjoyed it it was such a great experience the discussions that i had with him and they kind of uh, molded my thinking in many ways and um, one uh, interesting thing he he makes uh, he has chiku orchards chiku sapota and um, some of the sweetest and the most delicious chikus that i've ever eaten pure sugar they are so sweet and so tasty i cannot forget that i just thought i'd share it with you i hope everyone enjoyed this uh, movie i wanted to keep this uh, this for the last uh, like a dessert uh, i hope uh, that in these uh, all these sessions starting on uh, tuesday uh, from the sustainability uh, talk and uh, the uh, talk on um, water and energy and this one on food uh, i have i have tried to share many different perspectives uh with uh, this uh huge audience of all teachers um this is i think uh, what what i have uh, shown are these are some pointers uh, to the best of my understanding you know uh, they, there is no guarantee that that is the best or that is uh, uh, the on, the only perspective there are many more perspectives uh, but uh, i i feel that uh, some of the things that that are shared over here are definitely worth further investigation and uh, all of us are are very qualified very mature uh, people so we are capable of uh, doing that inquiry of investigating further and uh, taking this forward and to make it very meaningful personally to ourselves as well as our students so if uh, i i i would say that uh, really we need to only open our eyes around there are natural places you can learn directly from nature you can learn from people who have learnt about nature uh, such as this uh, great gentleman we uh, we saw on the video 
So um, that is all I have to share with you and uh, this completes my set of uh, sessions that I will be uh, sharing with you. Okay, so with this I, I take your leave, thank you very much for hearing me out.